Hello, welcome to Adapt and Place, a place of knowledge packed and commonly tested content in your English. Today, I want to give you a very important topic that usually you see it in your exams is pneumothorax and chest tube pearl. Everything you need to know about chest tube in a very short time, you get all the tips and tricks in answering questions on that. So expect to see this question and the topic on your chest. So let's get to it quickly. Before we talk about the chest tube, let's go to um, in, talk about pneumothorax. So this is your chest wall, okay? And the chest wall is surrounded a uh, thoracic cavity. So, and your trachea come in and it branches into in the bronchi. And then your lung surrounded this. So the lung is here like that. And then uh, you have the, the chest wall, the diaphragm sits here like that. So this is your diaphragm. This is your lung. This is the trachea. And this is the bronchial. So when you take a deep breath, this is what happened. It comes through the trachea. It goes through the bronchial into the lung. And then it exchanges it with the blood that's around the lung. Then CO2 comes out. Um, this space uh, is difficult to draw, but there's a space here called the pleural space. So I'll use the chest wall as that. So this is the pleural space. That means the space surrounding, just the, um, it's a space surrounding the lung. Um, and usually there's nothing there. There's nothing, okay? There shouldn't be any air or gas. So no air or gas there. No, nothing in the plural space. If he, he, unfortunately, sometimes you get injured. So your ribs are here. You have your ribs here, like that. If you are involved in a car accident or you have a rib fracture, it breaks this skin through the plural space and exposes it to a bunch of air bubbles. Or it punctured the lung, so these air uh, escape into the the pleural space. So you have O2 in the pleural space all over. This is what we call nemo thorax. Thorax means chest. Pneumo means air bubbles. So presence of air bubbles in the pleural space is what is called pneumothorax. It's a fancy word, but you can break it down and you can see. Presence of air in the pleural space is pneumothorax. It's not supposed to be there. What do you think it would do? So that's what you have to worry about. Now we're having these uh, bubbles pushing or these guys pushing on the lung. Well, the lung gets smaller, it collapses. So it will it collapse the lung. So the lung get collapsed. So collapse long. Based on this pathophysiology, this what happened, then you can say, okay, signs and symptoms. And that is what your test want to be like. Even in the next generation, what well, how would these patient next generation questions, how would this patient present when they present it to you? That is this patient has pneumothorax. Well, if you listen to them, you can hear breath sound better here. On the, assuming this is the right and this is the left. On the left, you have decreased breath sound. When you, you're listening, you listen to the lung, not the chest wall. So in the lung, as the lung expands, you're listening to the lung and you have decreased breath sound on the side of the injury. So on the side of the affected side. So that's what you will hear, okay? On the, um, the, the right side will be fine, but this you will decrease breath sound. If the patient is having decreased breath sound, well, they will be short of breath. And the classic thing they will tell you, they have chest pain. They're going to have pain when they take a deep breath with breathing, okay? Pain with deep breathing, okay? Or when they take breath. So inspiration, when they inspire, take a deep breath 
um, they have pain and it's very painful. And then the sides, when you if you check the sides, because the lung is collapsed, it will be decreased. So these are some of the classic four classics um, and symptoms that you will see somebody. They will basically all these represent respiratory distress. And this is an emergency. You have to do something about it. Any patient with pneumothorax is an emergency because if you have to be sharp about it, and the sharp is airway, they will have respiratory distress. So this patient, you have to see them as soon as possible. Um, otherwise, they're going to be in trouble. They won't have any air to breathe anymore, and they will die. So that's the symptoms. Inspirational pain with deep uh, and when they take a deep breath, they will be short of breath. Uh, they have decreased breath sound on that, on that side, um, and their sides will be decreasing. So what um, the treatment will you do? Well, we got to let the air out. So we got to bring all the air, gas bubble that stay in the plural space. We need to come out from it. And the treatment is chest tube. Chest tube is just a uh, plastic, different sizes that they make a hole into the chest and they put a tube, they put a tube, I'll show you a picture. They put a tube through the lung uh, into the pleural space and allow the air to escape. Basically you sucking it out. And so that is the treatment. They get chest tube treatment. Unfortunately, it sometimes it's not only air bubble or gas. When you have trauma or somebody punch you in the chest or they stab you or you have car accident, sometimes you can get blood. So you can get blood here. So this is all blood in the space. In the same plural space, okay? It's not gas, but it's just blood. This is what we call emo thorax, blood in the chest, that is not supposed to be there. So they, they are the same, except it's what you're dealing with. So pneumothorax mean air in the thoracic cavity and uh, hemothorax is just air in the pleural space, both of them. The treatment is the same, chest tube. You put your chest tube here, it will drain all the blood out and the lung will expand this lung will also collapse. They're going to have the same um, presentation. You expect some decreased breath sound, shortness of breath, saturation will go down because the lung cannot expand. And you put a chest tube in, you suck all the fluid out, and then it goes away. Remember, this is what we do with pleural effusion. It's the same thing. Pleural effusion means you have some fluid here. You have fluid in the pleural space. It can be due to infection. It can be due to cancer or something you know, getting to your lung. Mostly infection and cancer is number one. Or you get sick and you have too much fluid and they're resuscitating you. And you have a, a fluid in the pleural space. When we're draining it, we use the same chest tube. So chest tube is very important. So that's... Um, everything I would say about this um, to make it brief. Unfortunately, the 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 the, the, the pneumothorax that I draw, if the your body doesn't have time to adjust or the the air the bubble accumulate too fast, it causes something we call tension physiology. That means it's going to move things around. So this is the, the, the lung is here, sitting here like that. If the gas or the air bubble accumulate too fast or you do not have time to get rid of them, and so assuming this is all the air coming in, you don't have time to get rid of them and they accumulate quickly, the lung will be completely collapsed. The lung will be completely collapsed here. And what happened? The, the, the gas start pushing, starts pushing the chest away from where the gas is. So you will have something like that. This is moving away. So you have something like, like that. So this is the trachea. 
uh, still, and then the chest wall is here, and the long, this long is like squish here, and this long is just sitting here, it's all squish. And then on the left side, all you have is a bunch of air bubbles sitting here and pushing the lung. And you see what is happening to the trachea. This is what we call tension pneumothorax. There is a tension physiology. So the trachea will move to you have tracheal deviation. When you see, who do you see first question? And then they say tracheal deviation, you got to pick that one. Tension pneumothorax, patient dies. Tracheal deviation away from where the um the the gas is air bubble or gas mostly and uh, gas basically air in the space pushes it away um uh, from that side so that's tension tracheal deviation the same thing you're going to have um decrease or no breath sound on the affected side this side um then because you have gas all gas sitting here they will be resonating. So you hear in, in your answer choice, if you see hyper resonance. So hyper resonance of the air on the affected side is because if there's too much air outside the lung. So that's what you're hearing. But you listen to the lung itself, the yeah, breath sound will be decreased. Because things are moving, it's being shifted from the where the lung is initially, this is going to also compress the heart. So you have blood pressure will go down. There will be venous decrease, um, um, yeah, ejection fraction. Basically, your heart cannot pump well the way it is supposed to. It's being compressed by the lung. So they have blood pressure changes. And so this is classic symptoms of tension in motorized. Tracheal deviation is a good sign. Tracheal deviation, decreased breath sound, hyper resonance, and decrease blood pressure, and that's tension in motorized. This treatment, you don't have time to put chest tube in. So they will get, we call it needle decompression. That's emergency. This is another emergency. You have to do uh, take care of this patient right away. It's an emergency. So uh, they do a needle decompression. Um, you use 14 to 16 gauge needle and you put them in a, two places, okay? Um, second intercostal space, so second intercostal space at mid clavicular line, um, right here, okay, where it is. Or you go to the third and eighth, fourth and fifth, fourth slash fifth intercostal space anterior axillary line. This is where you do needle decompression of the chest and you hear a rush of air coming out. This has to be done urgently as soon as possible. Otherwise, the patient die. This is who you see patient. You see tracheal deviation, you have to choose it. That is a sign of tension in For patients, who do you see with one patient with tracheal deviation? Yes, it's your patient. Need a decompression. You have to see them. Now, let's look at uh, what we need to know about, about the chest tube. So the chest tube has three, uh, three components, okay? There's three chambers. So this is chamber one. This is chamber two. And this is chamber three. And there's three connection. There's one here and this one here. Okay. So this one go to the patient. This is to patient. And this is, so this is the patient, right? Connected to the chest tube. So this is what is going to drain the air out and the fluid in case there's a fluid. This is connected to a suction. So this area, we call it the collection, collection chamber. So this is the collection chamber, okay? It's the collection chamber. So this one 
is the collection chamber. I will put a C. This side, okay, that is connected to a suction with a certain pressure. Usually, there's a normal here. I don't know if you can see. We put a pressure of 20, negative 20 millimeter per mercury. There's 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, all the way up. Um, uh, the, 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 the usual normal pressure we put is negative 20 millimeter per mercury. That's the most common. So this is connected and that's the pressure that is going to the system. So that's the, this become the suction chamber. And in between them, I don't know if you can see, it's here. Yeah. It, it, the, 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 this, the, this one is different, okay? This is the, oh, okay, this is the, the suction chamber, okay? This little area from here to here is the water seal, water seal chamber. That is the water seal chamber. The, the collection chamber, I think it goes all the way here. It goes all the way here. So this is all the collection chamber. And then this is the suction chamber. And then this is the water seal chamber, okay? I will explain all of them what they mean. So um, basically, uh, fluid come from the patient. You go into the um, the collection chamber, and then we have the water seal chamber and suction chamber. So the main idea is you put a suction into the suction chamber, and the water seal act as a barrier, and then that pressure allow the chest tube to drain whatever is in the patient chest, okay? The, the function of the water seal, okay, is very important. Is to prevent air bubbles or air molecules from escaping to the patient. So since you put in suction here, you don't want air bubbles to go back into the patient because that's what, why we sucking it from the patient, okay? Um, then this is the pressure here. There's a certain pressure you put on the suction chamber. So for your for your test, you have to know the, the, the different side where you have all the numbers from here to here is usually the collection chamber. But here you see a bubble and a small line here like that. That is the water seal. And the, the other side where you have the water and this is the dust and this is the um, suction chamber. And so there's few things you have to know. So we start with the, um, let's start with the collection chamber. So like I said, it's connected to the patient and it's like fluid and air from the patient. That's what they do, okay? Um, it's usually a tape to the patient, is secure in place, every connection is completely tight. You don't want them to dislodge, but there's things that can happen, okay? Nothing is perfect. These things all the time pull. Patient move around, they pull it. So if the tube disconnect from the drainage system, so if this is the drainage system, okay? No, this is the collecting system. Collecting system, okay? And if this is the chest tube, okay? This is the chest tube, chest tube. If you end up disconnecting it from the patient, so this, basically move away from the patient, okay? The tube come out from the, the, the collection chamber. So this is still with the patient, but this tube is pulled out from the collection chamber. So out of the collection chamber. What you need to do is first see if it's contaminated. So if no contamination, then you wipe it with some sterile uh, antiseptics and then reconnect it, reconnect it back into the chamber. But if it get, you, you see that it's contaminated, so we get to the floor, 
or there's he became dirty when he, he pulled from the chamber or if you see that the area is break there's a breakage in the tube as he moved from here so there's a problem you can't reconnect it to the the collect the, the whole chamber again or the collection uh, uh, chamber what you need to do is find you know, sterile water put it in the bowl and insect the tube in it while this is still connected to the patient. This gives you some time. Um, and you need at least 250 cc of water or ml of water. And this has to be like two to four centimeters below um, the water. So that's if the tube disconnect from the collection chamber and is contaminated, don't reconnect really it to the collection chamber. Um, insect it into the, um, it, it wipe it, uh, um, what do they call it? Submerge it in a distal, um, in, in, in a container containing sterile water, okay, about 250 um, ml of flu uh, sterile fluid, and then go and get another um, whole system and reconnect it. I mean, that will give you some time. This is the reason why you expect them to ask you, anybody who have a chest tube in place, what are the two things you need in at bedside? What are the two things you need at the patient bedside for a patient who has a chest tube? Because of this, this will happen. It will disconnect from the patient and it will get contaminated and you have no chance. Your every second count in this place. And so, Every patient need who has chest tube need two things, no matter what. They need 250 cc at least. I always use cc ml um, of sterile water, okay, at bedside. And then they also need antiseptic wipes so that you can wipe the tube in case you fall. These two things is a must. 250 cc of st sterile water, which is 250 ml, and then an antiseptic wipes. Anybody with a chest tube, you need to have it because if that happen, yeah, you get to do it. If you disconnect from the chamber. The other thing too, you need to know is this connection Going to the patient, to the collection chamber, never cl clamp this. Do not clamp. No clamping, okay? This shouldn't be clamped. If you clamp, you create tension pneumothorax. So do not clamp. But look at the next thing I would say. I intentionally said that. Do not clamp. But you can clamp it less than one minute. How? You say don't clamp the thing, but then you say I can clamp it one minute, less than one minute. Well, if you want to change the whole system, you got to do something to the tube. Yeah, you can keep the tube sterile and clamp the end of it. And then quickly you know, pull it from, the, from here and, and put a new, the whole new system and connect this to that. So you can clamp it at least uh, no more than one minute to uh, um, to change the whole system. You change the chest tube, you, you're changing it. And then secondly, if you want to check for air leak, you can clamp it less than one minute. Basically air leak means you're checking if there's a break in the system. The system is all sealed up, it's a water cook, it's a closed system and you don't want air to leak at all. So when you're checking for air leak, you, you clamp it just for less than one minute quickly and then you uh, unclamp it as soon as possible. So that is the only time. These are the three conditions, two conditions. You don't clamp it unless the doctor tell you to clamp it. But you can clamp it without an order if it's less than one minute uh, and you're changing the tube or you're checking for air leak. Those are the um, key facts about that. Now, let's go to the water seal. 
this blue area from here to here. I told you this area, the water seal, that black area, but not the, the whole blue, this side is to prevent air from leaking back to the patient. So that's your plan. Um, there's two things you will see, okay? There's something we call tidling. And this, sometimes they ask you, they trick you. Tidling means when they, 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 this thing connected to the patient, okay? The chest tube connected to the patient. When patient take deep breath, water from the tube will go back and forth, back and forth. Water moving, uh, the drainage, the drain that is coming from the chest, it go up, down, up, down. So up, down or fluid through the tube, when a patient take inspiration, uh, inspiration and expiratory breath, that's what we call tightening. It's just telling you the tube is functioning, is good, is good, is functioning. Therefore, no tightening. So the question will ask you, you look at a chest tube, there is no tightening. We know when it's tightening, it's functioning well. Therefore, if we see no tightening, what do we do? Well, check for break, kicking, whether this is kink. When it's kink, it will not tide. So it will not tidal in. So kick, kinking. So check for kinking as number one. Okay. And then check, listen to the breath sound. Okay. Breath sound and see if the patient is breathing because you know when they take deep breath in and out, that causes the tidaling. So they may be taking deep breath, but it, if the tube is clamped, is kink, they won't be you won't seeing the tight lane in it. Then if you if you check and there's no kink, listen to the patient and then see if they're breathing. Okay. You can do the other way. It doesn't matter. I think in your test, I would rather listen to the patient first, then check for kinking. Assessment and then looking for kinking. So this is more reasonable. Um, listen for the patient and then check for kinking. So that is tidling. That's what we see with tidling. Another thing happened, number two, in the water seal chamber. That's what is called water seal. We see air leak. And how do we see air leak? You see bubbling. We're not supposed to see bubble, okay? I told you air shouldn't escape through the system because of the water seal. So if there's air there, it will stay in the water seal area. That's why that is the function of the water seal. So this is the water, water seal area. It's there to trap any air molecule in the system. So if the and the, when you see air molecule will present as hair leak. So it's leaking. We got to get rid of it. And how do you see it? You see bubbling. Here, you see bubbling going in like a go, 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 bubbling. There's two types, okay? There's the continuous bubbling and intermittent. Intermittent bubbling is expected, okay? If somebody have pneumothorax, so if they have pneumothorax, they, 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 the symbol is PTX. If somebody have pneumothorax, I expect some air in the lung. So I should see small air leak in the system. And that air leak is usually intermittent air leak. So don't be fooled with, by the examiner when they say somebody have pneumothorax and you see air leak, the, is it a big problem? No, it, it's going to resolve as they, uh, all the air gets sucked out and now the pneumothorax. Remember pneumothorax is the injury to the lung. The lung will repair itself and the lung will seal. When the lung seal, there will be no escape of air anymore. So intermittent uh, air leak is okay for a patient with pneumothorax. And that is an expected finding, an expected finding in the patient with uh, pneumothorax. Continuous bubbling is bad. That's your boy. You should not let it go. Continuous bubbling is not good. And so it's bad, this is bad. So what do you do? That means something, is that, is that the air is coming from the patient, they have bad lung injury or the system is broken. So patient with 
bad lung injury. We don't want it. We don't like that. Our system is broken. So you got to fix the system. So your management, that's another question they can ask you. You see continuous bubbling. What do you do? Well, assess the patient first. And how do you assess? So that is, you go to the, this is the patient. And this is the chest tube, okay? You go to the patient and check and make sure all the tapes are on. Everything is sealed. There's nothing broken. So patient face. So assess patient. Then you start working from the tube, making sure there's all the seal is good. And after you've done that, you go to the chamber now. And then um, you see if the connection is tight or connection, tight connection is okay. Right? If everything looks fine, then um, you just have to reach, um, change the system again. If it, and then you know that is the patient that is the patient, the continuous hair leak is the patient problem. He has really bad hair leak, a, a long injury, and the doctor has to be notified and he probably may need surgery. Sometimes, I don't want to bother you guys, but it shows that there's a bronchial injury or um, ero digestive, we call it ero digestive injury. That means the airway is injury or the uh, digestive system is injury, like your esophagus, maybe in the chest, or you have a bronchial injury. But you guys don't need to worry about it. Just know that continuous bubbling is really bad. It means either the system is broken or the patient is broken. What I mean, the patient is broken. They have like large, massive bronchial injury or the system, there's a break in the system. So you assess the patient, you listen to the alarm and you check the um, the taping and, and walk backward. The connection system, everything is fine. And then look at the system. If there's nothing, you can change the system, but then the doctor needs to be notified. So that is that for the water seal chamber. And the last one is the suction chamber, okay? The suction chamber, like I said, is connected to a suction. So suction pressure in your, how you like NG tube or something like that, you bring in suction into the system. So it brings suction into the system. And then, so the, this is usually set like 20 millimeter per mercury, negative 20, that's the pressure. You can go up for kids. Sometimes you can set it to like five because they're young. So the pressure changes. This is the tricky one that they, they always trick you with. If I'm putting suction into the suction chamber, as you say, bubbling, continuous bubbling, okay? Gentle, continuous bubbling this is an expected finding in the suction chamber there's bubbling which is gentle and is continuous this is not bad compared to the hair leak where you see continuous bubbling a, a bubbling and a gentle continuous one in the suction chamber is an expected finding therefore no bubbling well then you see how they can ask you. When you have positive, you know something, you ask yourself, what would they do? They can ask me backward. If there's no bubbling, somebody has a chest tube and there's no bubbling in the suction chamber, what do you do? Well, you, you have to check if there's suction, the suction is on, how much suction is going there, and then whether there is water. So the suction you need for the for this for bubbling to occur, you need suction. And you need a tube to connect to the suction. And you need water into the system to give you the pressure. You, you see there's a level here. You put water at to that level, and that's the pressure. So check the wall if the suction is on. Check the tube if it's not broken and check if the water level is at the right area that you're supposed to. And that is your systematic check. And therefore expect that like in the SATA form, they can ask you or 
prioritization question from bubbling, um, no bubbling. Well, I need to check if I'm getting suction. I need to check if the tube is not broken and I need to check if this uh, water uh, level is fine. So that is what um, happened with that suction area. There's one thing they can ask you, okay? If this is the chest tube again, and this is my, my boy, he's getting, he has chest tube in place. If you accidentally, it happened, when I'm, whatever I'm talking, I'm a colorectal surgeon, I'm a general surgeon, by, and, and so I've seen this when, during my residency in medical school, this tube can come out from the patient, not the ch uh, chamber itself. So you have a ch patient sitting here and there's no chest tube anymore connected to him. And the chest tube is just hanging here like that. It's hanging. It's not connected to the patient. So tube out of the patient. What do you think? Well, the purpose of the tube is to suck air and fluid. So you will hear a buzzing or um, noise. You hear a buzzing or sucking, sucking chest noise. Or air leaking noise. I'm trying to let, give you some time to listen carefully. So there will be some buzzing sucking chest, something is sucking. <sighs> As they take a breath, air is being pulled into the chest or air, air leaking sound <sighs> is sucking, that kind of sound. That is the, the, the definition of sucking chest. And the treatment for sucking chest is take quickly, take a, basically air is going to the chest, they will develop tension in the motorized. Put, take a, a sterile gauze, put it on the area where the chest tube was and tape only three area to create a flatter valve. So you tape here, you tape here, and you tape here, and these become a flatter valve. So when they take a deep breath, this act like a flatter valve. So you open and allow the air to escape instead of coming in. So sterile gauze, or occlusive tape, occlusive dressing, but you tape three, only three side. Tape only three side. And that will treat that problem. So when a thing dislodge, dislodge from the patient, use a, you hear sounds, occlusive dressing, tape in three places. The, the the few ones that we left it is, what do you do? When do you remove this chest tube? Patient cannot go on with chest tube, removal of chest tube. I think I, I wanted to talk about this because it's important, they can ask you. When do you, the purpose of the chest tube is to remove what? Fluid is to remove air out and allow the patient lung to expand so that it can become normal. Well, if the fluid is less than 200 ml in 24 hours, you can remove it. Two, if there's no air leak, that means the lung has seal off. Patient is good. And three, if the lung expanded, and this one you need a chest X-ray. to confirm it. So these are the three things you have to know. Less than 224 hours, there's no hair leak and the lung has expanded. That's when you remove, you will pull the chest tube. Remember, the nurse does not pull the chest tube. Don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. Nurse, no pull, no pull. You don't pull the chest tube. You just assist the doctor and provide all the information that they need, or the supply that they need, but you never pull chest tube. Nurse should not pull a chest tube. That's a big problem. No, 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 no. You assist. So the examiner will trick you. They can trick you. You never pull it. 
you just assist the doctor. If if somebody has a chest tube, okay, for blood, so he has hemothorax. You will call the doctor when the, there is blood coming out, output is more than 100 ml, okay, per hour. So that's when you call, you gotta call. This is a classic question they can ask you. 100 ml per hour, call the doctor if there is blood. But if you just, um, a pro effusion, that's fine. But if this is blood, okay, somebody has, or they will tell you as the motorist, they put it, they put it in and they get 100 ml per hour, I'll call the doctor. Now, since we've talked about removal of chest tube, there is, um, when somebody have chest tube, how do you evaluate them? Well, you see them every hour. So post-op, somebody has chest tube, you need to be seen every hour for eight hours. Then after the uh, last eight hours, you see them every eight hours. So one hour, every one hour for the first eight hours. Then after the eight hours, you just do Q eight hours. So this is Q1 until it's eight hours. Then after that, you just do every eight hours. And the patient is ready for the chest to be removed. Like I said, chest to remove. What do you do the next? How do you educate and assist? Well, you you provide, you pre-medicate the patient. You need to pre-medicate. It's very painful. They get pain medication. Then after they get pain medication, you provide supplies. So the doctor needs to have like sutures to cut it. He need a sterile dressings. He need a tape to give or provide some supply. Then you need to tell the patient, they may ask you, what do you tell the patient while the doctor, usually the doctor is supposed to do that, but it's a collaboration. So you the nurse, you collaborate with the doctor and you teach the patient, teaching on how to pull. So do you tell the patient to take a deep breath or breathe out when the doctor is pulling? This is a good question they can ask you because you can get complication in that. My advice to you, and this should be, if you, you should know this, they take breath, breathe in, you tell them to breathe in, right? Then hold it, hold it, hold it. And then the doctor will continue to pull while they hold him. They don't let go. This is what we call vasava. So tell the patient to vasava while the doctor is pulling. So they're taking deep breath in, hold it, hold it, hold it as the doctor pull it. And as soon as they finish, then they can let go. Um, after the chest tube is removed, you need a chest X-ray to prevent another pneumothorax. It's funny. We put in for pneumothorax, but when we're removing it, patient can get pneumothorax. So you need to uh, get a chest X-ray. Usually it's within six hours, you know, um, within six hours. Usually me, I usually get it like four hours, but it's within six hours. Four hours, it takes that time for your lung to, if there's going to be air escape. I mean, there's a little bit of air escape, but it's not efficient. Um, it's not enough to cause a problem. So usually by four to six hours, um, if the patient is going to be symptomatic, you will see it. So in six hours, um, when you get a chest X-ray, you will see pneumothorax. If you get it in an hour, it's too early. I mean, you may not see it. That's why some people say, wait. So six hours, I will take the average six hours. Um, it's okay to, to wait before you get a, um, what do they call it? Chest X-ray after chest tube is uh, pulled. So this is um, um, all you need to know about chest, chest tube. I tried to pull one more thing here that is related to pneumothorax. When you fracture your rib, this is the most painful thing you'll ever have, rib fracture. This is very short. 
very, very painful. Very, very painful. Because of that, when a patient come in, you want to prevent complication. And what is that? Please, please, please give them their pain medication. This is not the patient you give them Tylenol. No. Sometimes they have to get epidural. Some people will need epidural. So if they give you IV pain medication, I'm choosing it. Don't give them oral medication. You can add that, but the number one one is something IV, at least stronger medication. Otherwise they will get pneumonia and they will get sick and they will die from it. Teach them how to cough. So coughing is good. Coughing exercise. They need to use their IS, incentive spirometer. Okay? Incentive spirometer. And um, pulmonary toilet, we call it. So deep breathing, walking, and helping with that. So they need to do deep breathing, incentive spirometer, coughing, and adequate pain medication. Otherwise, they get pneumonia and they end up being intubated and they stay in the hospital for a long time so if they give you a question with the rib fracture um that's what you do sometimes they will tell you it's a flay chest flay f-a-l-i-l -L, chest flay chest that means these people it's not just rib fracture they fracture one two three in line because they gave um a Multiple refractions in line consecutively. And so these people need, when they take a deep breath, instead of the lung expanding, that chest goes down. And when they expire, that chest go up. It's called paradoxical, paradoxical chest movement. So when you see a question, when they say para dorsical chest movement for a patient who has rib fracture, it means they have what we call flay chest. These patients need a lot of pain medication, otherwise they will be intubated and they will have pneumonia and die from it. So this is all you need to know for lung pathology in terms of pneumothorax, chest tube, and rib fracture. Take care of yourself and um, Thank you for listening. Subscribe to my website and keep char charging.